Hi everyone, my name is Pete Florence and this is our work implicit behavioral cloning. This is joint work with Corey, Andy, Oscar, Azon, Laura, Adrian, Johnny, Igor, and Jonathan. Uh, this work was published at Coral last month and we want to thank the workshop organizers for inviting works from Coral um, here at the workshop. So our work is really about um, studying the form of policies that we use to map from observations to actions. And we study this in the context of behavior cloning, but um, uh, we, you know, we do this, yes, to give us better behavior cloning policies, but also we think to have some insights into the broader RL setting. And even just with behavior cloning, um, we get some state-of-the-art results specifically on the D4RL human expert tasks. We also have some theoretical insight into universal approximation of discontinuous and multivalued functions. So behavior cloning is arguably the simplest possible way to get uh, a policy. So just, you know, given some observations and actions from some expert, learn some conditional generative model that maps from observations to actions. And of course, there are many known issues with uh, behavior cloning, uh, notably compounding errors and distribution shift. And there's been a variety of antidotes offered in the literature to um, help alleviate some of these issues. So you can do things like collect on policy data and uh, get an expert to label it as in Dagger, or collect some on policy data and do some distribution matching as in Gale, or collect some reward labels uh, for the demonstrator data um, as in offline RL. And these are all good ideas. But one thing that's potentially underappreciated is that you know despite these valid concerns, in practice, vanilla BC is already pretty useful. And um, you know, both for uh, robot learning in the real world, but also even on uh, offline RL benchmarks, even vanilla BC already shows pretty reasonable results as a baseline on these benchmarks. And what we show in this work is that implicit BC is uh, somehow a seemingly even more useful form of BC. And one thing that we want to think about as we look at these results is think about why that might be the case. So before we go too much further, let's uh, establish a couple definitions. So what do we mean by explicit? Uh, by explicit, we mean uh, some generative model, which uh, maps in essentially a feed forward process with a continuous model from observations to actions. Shown here is just the deterministic version, but you know there's the stochastic analog as well. Um, that's what we mean by explicit. By implicit, we mean the composition of argmin with some continuous function, which takes in both observations and actions. And we can get one of these, for example, by training a conditional energy-based model and performing inference as optimization. And you might be thinking to yourself, hey, this looks like a Q function. Uh, yes, it's very much uh, looks like a Q function, uh, just that we're only doing supervised learning here uh, with no need for rewards. I also want to call out that our work very much builds on the uh, energy-based model literature. And there's especially recently a, a variety of other notions of implicitness that have been explored in machine learning. And here's a handful of references. Let's talk briefly about how we do training and inference with these types of models. Um, we use an info NCE style loss, but there's a variety of loss functions that you could use. On the right here, we're showing um, uh, what the training process looks like for a, a model fitting a, a step function, for example. Uh, and then for the two key steps of generating uh, contrastive samples and performing inference, we use a few different recipes. The simplest is just to do random sampling and derivative free optimization, which is really easy. Uh, the only uh, downside is that it doesn't scale well to high dimensional action spaces. But to do that, to scale to higher dimensional action spaces, uh, we use either an autoregressive version of the first one, or we, uh, we use Longevin Dynamics, which uses the gradients of the energy. Um, and these latter two scale well to high dimensional action spaces. So one thing we want to think about um, to prime ourselves as we uh, look at some of these results is what are the practical benefits of implicit models? And uh, there's three that we want to highlight. So one is that they seem to generalize differently than explicit models in some cases that we care about. Second, uh, they seem to fit discontinuities with discontinuities, which just empirically uh, seems to be a property that helps them in um, some tasks that you might care about. And third, uh, they tend to excel at multimodality. And this last one is probably the one that folks seem to jump onto, uh, you know, latch onto the easiest, but it's these first two um, that are potentially a little bit more surprising. And so we're gonna talk about those a little bit. So first with generalization, we're gonna look at a, a very simple example. This is just a uh, visual uh, uh, coordinate regression task where uh, this is you know, just supervised learning, no policy learning with closed loop. Um, 
uh, interaction here. The task is just to take in an image and regress the coordinates of uh, you know, the continuous coordinates of some pixels in the image. And here's uh, one example image shown here where there's these green pixels. You need to you know, train from examples of this to regress the coordinates of the center of those green pixels. And this is somewhat of a canonical task studied in computer vision. And we're going to compare results with training an explicit model with the architecture shown on top versus an implicit model with the architecture shown on the bottom. And with an explicit model, if you train on 10 training examples and the convex hull of the training data is this um, gray dotted line, um, blue uh, dots are where the model performed well uh, in generalization. And then uh, the rest of the ones that are not blue are showing errors in an increasing scale in terms of their uh, red color. And you see that uh, the model does well near the training data, but struggles to generalize in this case. Whereas meanwhile, with an implicit model, you can get essentially perfect generalization just from a few examples. And um, this just, you know, this is just one task, but it does go to show that uh, the generalization properties of implicit models can be quite different than those of explicit models. I also want to note that this result has been uh, replicated already a couple times um, by third parties in open source. Uh, here's a couple links for you here. Um, another thing we want to look at is discontinuities. And just to build a motivating example, uh, to think about how discontinuities of, arise in the real world with continuous action policies, let's think about uh, this graph here where on the x-axis we have some state dimension, the y-axis we have some action dimension, and we're going to have some type of discontinuous policy where a threshold and state is reached and the action needs to, ch to change sharply. And uh, as a, an example, let's have that state dimension be uh, the position of a block moving from you know, left to right, and the action dimension uh, be the robot moving left and right. And these are just a subset of the dimensions that uh, you that this is just a subset of the dimensions. You know, of course, probably higher dimensional cases that we care about. Um, but so if we have some blue block and we want to slide it into some black slot, you can imagine pushing the blue block left until it aligns uh, perfectly with that black slot. And once you do that, you push the robot, uh, you push the block far enough to the left, then the robot would want to stop it there and start moving to the right and go around and push it from the top. And if you can uh, fit this well from some demonstrations, then you can get this very nice, precise policy where the robot can slide the blue block into place and then move around and slide it into place. And this is just, again, one motivating example of what discontinuities can look like in the real world. Uh, one thing we do is we look at, you know, just in practice, how do implicit versus explicit models um, tend to fit discontinuities? So on the top here, we have some implicit models. On the bottom, we have some explicit models. Um, these are fitting a variety of discontinuous functions. Um, uh, it, should, it should come as no surprise that explicit models with continuous activation functions, they are continuous mappings. And so all they can do uh, when presented with a discontinuity is you know, essentially interpolate and draw continuous curves in between the closest training points on either side of the discontinuity. With implicit models, on the other hand, they tend to fit discontinuities with discontinuities, which depending on the task uh, might be beneficial. So let's look at some policy learning results. We have uh, uh, results of comparing implicit BC versus baselines across a variety of domains. A couple things I want to highlight here is first on the left, uh, just using behavior cloning, we can get comparable results with offline RL, uh, uh, state-of-the-art offline RL, on the D4RL human expert tasks, uh, using just a little bit of reward information. Um, so doing essentially reward weighted regression, then we can uh, outperform even S4RL uh, average across these different tasks. And on the right, I want to highlight that implicit BC seems to work especially well in the real world. So I want to look first at this particle integrator task a little bit. It's a nice sort of a pedagogical task. So Imagine that you're the expert on this task and you're this black dot and your goal in life is to first go to the green dot and then once you're close enough to the green dot to switch over to the blue dot. Um, and the red X visualizes your actions over time. So note that there's no multimodality in this task. You just go always first to the green dot and then to the blue dot. Um, but the specific challenge is that this is a discontinuous policy and you need to train from some examples, some configurations of the world and generalize to new ones. So if you train in a continuous explicit model um, on this type of a task, then you might get this type of a performance where you know, this is admittedly a little bit of an undertrained model, but it's meant to be educational here, where uh, you know, the failure mode is you get this type of middling behavior and this leads to compounding errors 
and then uh, you know you you don't fit the discontinuities well, and you just get this kind of mess of compounding mushy errors. Um, this is a type of behavior you see with explicit models. Uh, implicit models, on the other hand, tend to very easily fit these discontinuities uh, very sharply. And this is an example of a policy that you can get with an implicit model on this task. Um, moving on to another task, this is the pen task from the D4RL suite. Looking at a few uh, baselines on this task, uh, you, you can generally see the story here is that S4RL does a little bit better than CQL, which does a little bit better than the BC baseline from CQL. Um, Interesting on this task, but not on all tasks, we find that uh, nearest neighbor, just nearest neighbor lookup of the uh, closest observations in the data set and use the corresponding actions. That actually provides a, a pretty competitive baseline on the test. Um, with our own best explicit model, we can get uh, a little bit better than that. And then with our be own best implicit model, we can do uh, quite a bit better still on that task as shown here. And this is an example of an implicit policy um, rolled out on that task, on this pen task. Uh, looking at a couple more tasks, these are the um, sweeping tasks that we experiment with in the paper. On the top, this is a planar sweeping task where the agent needs to push all of these gray particles into the green target region. And on the bottom, this is a bimanual sweeping task where uh, the agent has two six degree of freedom arms it's controlling and needs to coordinate and needs to sweep all these particles off the table. Um, on both these tasks, we find that we can train implicit BC policies to get um, notably higher performance than the best, best explicit policies that we can find. Uh, let's look at a couple examples of implicit policies in the real world. On the left here, we have a um, sorting task where the robot's goal is to sort the blue box from the yellow blocks. Um, and on the right here, we have a precise uh, slide and insertion task where the robot first needs to slide the blue block across the table and then precisely insert it with millimeter tolerance into this blue uh, or into this black uh, slot that we were looking at earlier. Uh, the right one was trained with about 200 demonstrations. The left one was trained with about 500 demonstrations. And the only input to these policies is just RGB camera images at five hertz with nothing else. And on the left here, we're showing uh, this is. Corey and myself just playing with the robot and pushing the yellow and blue blocks around. And it wasn't trained on anything like this, um, but it tends to be pretty robust um, at a, you know, uh, uh, robust to these disturbances that again, it wasn't trained on. We'll just show this finishing out on the left here, uh, this robot getting um, these blocks into the right spot. One quantitative difference I want to highlight on these um, uh, real world examples is uh, this is on the left, the implicit models uh, compared with a uh, you know, uh, demonstrative example of an explicit model on the right. And in general, we find that we can get about an order of magnitude higher success rate with implicit versus explicit policies on this precise insertion task. I just want to say a few things about theory. Um, really, the main thing I want to get across is uh, this intuitive notion of how you can represent discontinuities with implicit models where um, there are implicit models with continuous energy functions. So how can you represent discon discontinuities even with a continuous energy function? And uh, I flipped it so that it's the argmax, so it's a little bit easier to see here. Um, but this picture is, uh, you want to think about kind of these two ridges that are passing by each other. And as the elevation of one ridge, um, you know, beats out the elevation of the other ridge, then the argmax here switches between these two different ridges. And that's the kind of intuitive notion of how you can represent discontinuities, even with continuous energy functions. And you can extend the same notion uh, to represent multi-valued functions just with a few ridges here. Um, uh, more rigorously in the paper, the two uh, notions that we look at are around, you know, those were a couple analytical functions on the previous page, but what, what class of functions do these uh, properties extend to around representation and approximation? Um, and I'll leave the details for you to look at in the paper, um, but what I want to note is that we develop a notion of universal approximation that's achievable even for discontinuous and multivalued functions um, via implicit models. And just in closing here, I just want to highlight that the um, regimes of tasks that we uh, demonstrate in the paper uh, involve a few different challenging regimes, including uh, tasks with a very low number of demonstrations, as few as 19, um, tasks with high dimensional uh, image observations, 
and tasks with pretty high dimensional action spaces, uh, up to 30 or so with some of the D4RL tasks. With that, I'll close. Um, thanks for listening and uh, looking forward to chatting with folks uh, about questions. Thanks.